welcome uh, from the Magnets team. Um, let me remind you that this seminar is about 25 minutes presentation, followed by 10 to 15 minutes time for your questions and answers. And there is going to be time for catch up, which is not recorded, and uh, we welcome everybody to stay along. I am really happy and excited today to present to present to you Geoff Lerner, who's going to talk about using paleomagnetism to evaluate volcanic hazards. Um, so please, Geoff, um, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for for coming, uh, and I'm going to talk about a subject that that I find interesting, and I hope everyone else will. Um, and it's based on on some work I've done with with uh, a bunch of different colleagues um, across a few different places that I've, I've worked from my PhD through now. So so from you know, working at uh, University of Auckland in New Zealand, Earth Observatory of Singapore, and now I'm at the National Autonomous University of Mexico uh, in Mexico City. And uh, most of the colleagues were either are or were in, in New Zealand um, and are now in some other places as well. So. What I want to talk about is uh, using paleomagnetism to look at volcanic hazards and, and evaluate volcanic processes. And uh, I think we, in paleomagnetism, we we use volcanic rocks for for many of our studies, and I'm sure most of you who have used paleomagnetism have have used volcanic rocks at some point um, because they're good carriers of magnetic data. So they they contain magnetic mineralogy typically, uh, and we can use them for Pretty much every every type of paleomagnetic study, whether it's looking at the Earth's interior or geomagnetic reversals, or many many things more than than I'm going to list. Uh, but uh, what I'm interested in, as as a sort of a volcanologist that does paleomagnetism, is turning it around and and saying, well, as as long as our volcanic rocks record well paleomagnetic information. Let's use those rocks instead to to look at the volcanoes themselves and the processes that resulted in in the formation of those volcanic rocks. And so, what we can do with that, uh, with our our paleomagnetic or rock magnetic methods, is we can we can do absolute or or relative dating um, on on eruption ages. We can look at the emplacement temperatures of of a variety of volcanic deposits. We can look at what direction was a, a volcanic flow flowing in, uh, which we could maybe use to identify where it came from if we don't already know. Uh, and we can look at uh, maybe sediment cores to find crypto tephra to potentially identify eruptions that, that we hadn't previously seen. And so uh, today uh, I'm going to be talking about how we can use paleomagnetism uh, through two different studies to look at two very different volcanic hazards uh, that have a lot of things that are different, but important things in common that allows us to study them with paleomagnetism. So we have lava flows and we have pyroclastic density currents. And so we're going to look at them. So lava flows, right, they're molten volcanic rock. They're dense. Um, they're still uh, in liquid form. Uh, whereas pyroclastic density currents are a mix of gas and uh, fragmented rock that comes out of an eruptive cloud that races down the side of the volcano. So speed we're looking at of these hazards is, is quite different, right? So lava flows are typically slow. Um, most of the time we're looking at meters to second uh, to even maybe meters per day if it's mostly cooled and moving quite slowly. So this is a hazard that most of the time you could walk away from. Uh, whereas pyroclastic density currents, or, or PDCs, I'll probably call them many times during the talk, uh, are extremely fast, so up to over 100 meters per second. So we're talking a hazard that you can't even drive away from in most cases. So because of their, their characteristics, uh, lava flows are mostly dangerous to property. Uh, they can start fires. They can generate explosions from contact with water or, or, or fuel. Uh, so we're talking about this kind of hazard, whereas pyroclastic density currents are directly hazardous to people. So they're, they're usually, but not always fatal. Um, they can also damage buildings. So they have, they have extremely high dynamic pressure. Uh, so, so through temperature and force, they can cause extreme damage. But what they have in common is that they're both high temperature hazards. So both of these hazards, lava flows and PDCs, 
can be up to over 800 degrees, um, which means that they heat or reheat material that they come into contact with. And this is important because we use high temperatures when we're doing paleomagnetic experiments and we learn things about temperatures. And so we can combine those properties to, to use paleomagnetism to look at these hazards. And so the first thing that we're gonna look at is can we identify PDCs using paleomagnetism? Maybe when we couldn't identify them in the field. And so where we're gonna do that is in New Zealand at an active stratovolcano called Mount Taranaki. Uh, so Mount Taranaki has about 170,000 year history of pretty much every main type of eruption that, that there is. So it's had lava flows, it's had PDCs, it's had lahars, which are volcanic mud flows. So PDCs are a high temperature hazard. Lahars are, are mud flows, which means that they're usually a low temperature hazard. Um, it's also had debris avalanches, so, so big scale collapse of the volcano. Um, it hasn't erupted in over 200 years, but it's been quite active over the past thousand years, and it's expected to erupt again sometime in the, in the future, potentially in the next decades or, or century even. Um, and so the question is, if we look at this, this deposit in the picture at the bottom, um, can we always differentiate between hot and cold mass flow deposits in the field? So if we see these deposits that could be from different types of volcanic flows, particularly the hot PDCs or the cold lahars, uh, in the field, uh, it's not always so simple to, to tell them apart, especially because remobilized material is exactly that. It's, it's remobilized material of something that probably used to be hot at some point. And so it may look exactly the same when you see it in the deposit. Uh, and the reason that we care about this is, uh, one of the reasons is, is for making hazard maps. So it's important for hazard planning to know where are our more dangerous and more safe areas around the volcano in the case of an eruption. And so in the case of Mount Taranaki, this is an old hazard map from maybe 20 years before we, we did our study. Uh, and it was based on the fact that PDCs had been identified to about 15 kilometers from the volcano. And basically that's your red circle. And so the red circle was your highest hazard area and saying, if you're worried about pyroclastic density currents, that's the place where you need to be worried about it. And everything outside that are colors indicating some kind of lahar or, or cold deposit that can, has been mapped much further. And we wanted to see if, if we're always trying to improve hazard maps so people can be better prepared in the case of an eruption. And so what we did was we looked at some older deposits uh, from about 11 and a half thousand years ago that had been up until till our study considered to be all lahar deposits, right? Because they're all past 15 kilometers, they're all far away. Um, they're all these, these water saturated debris flows um, that, that were between 15 kilometers and the coast, which is 25 kilometers or so from the volcano. Uh, and, and these deposits in some places looked like what are characteristics of lahar deposits, but in other places they had these characteristics that are sometimes identified with, with hotter um, pyroclastic density currents. And so some of those include an indurated deposit, right? So the heat of the deposit uh, causes it to be much more, more cohesive, much more uh, durable. Um, and red crust bronze. So they're basically large chunks of, of clasts of, of a lava dome or, or, um, or fragmented material in an eruption that has a particular characteristic that's, that's typically associated with sin eruptive processes. And so we, what we did uh, was, yeah, we looked at this area uh, with different parts of this deposit. So some which could be lahars, but some which might have been hot. And, and we sampled these deposits for paleomagnetism. So the way this works was we sampled six locations um, between that range of 15 to 20 kilometers from the source. Uh, three of those we did sort of traditional sites for the method that I'm about to, to outline. So basically we sampled a bunch of, of clasts, so, so fist size rocks or, or larger um, from the same outcrop. And then in five sites, we, we instead sampled directly the matrix because it was consolidated enough that we could, we could take pieces of the matrix like you see in the picture on the right, and we could sort of put them in sampling cubes and, and turn them into cohesive samples and then cut them out of the cubes so we could use thermal demagnetization to do paleomagnetic experiments on them. So the way we measure emplacement temperature in a volcanic deposit 
is, as I said, right, we sample either a bunch of classes, so we take a bunch of these rocks from the same location, or we sample directly the matrix. And so now I want you to, to imagine a little bit of volcano, right? So we're going to imagine three possible scenarios at the volcano that represent the types of deposits we could find. So imagine a volcano, it erupts. We have this hot material coming out at the top of the volcano, and we have this pyroclastic density current, and it's, it's really hot. It's hotter than our Curie temperatures. So let's say it's at least 580 or, or 600 degrees or hotter, and it races down the volcano, this deposit all together. It, it gets to where it's going, it's, its furthest point, and it stops, and it's still very hot, and then it all cools together, right? So it all cools in the same place, in the same magnetic field at the same time. And that means that if we come back and we sample it later, however many years later, we would expect all of the material in that deposit to have taken on the same paleomagnetic direction, single component, and show us the same result. Uh, and that's what we will get if we look at all our class to our matrix. So now imagine the opposite scenario. We have, um, we have our hot material, it's erupted, it's emplaced, it all cools in the same place, it all takes on the same direction, but then it moves again, right? So it's, it's water saturated or, or for another reason, it moves further down the volcano. We've basically taken our directions that were all the same and we physically reworked them, physically moved every single piece of this deposit. And so now if we sample this deposit later on, we'd expect to get a completely random set of directions from our various class or matrix samples. Okay, and one more scenario is in the middle. So imagine we have a pyroclastic density current that's either below Curie temperature already to start, or imagine it's deposited and it cools a little bit and then it moves again. Uh, in this case, we'd expect to get a more complicated result when we measure the samples. We'd expect to get at least, at least two components. And the last component would be the component where the material has all cooled together in the same field and would show a consistent direction. So we would see uh, a consistent direction at this low temperature, uh, but at the higher temperatures before the material moved, we'd expect to see that random alignment. So we use that to, to decide how was our, uh, how are our deposits in place. So uh, we got results from, from all these different sites and they mostly looked like this, right? So we had, as I said, a high temperature component and a low temperature component. And you can see in our high temperature component, uh, you, you, you do a randomness test, but I like this method because I think most of the time you can even just, you could show this to, to anyone and they would usually agree with you by eye um, that the one on the left is, is pretty random alignment of class of, of, of paleomagnetic directions on our stereo plot. And uh, our, our low temperature component on the right is much more aligned, they're much more consistent. And so we did that on a variety of samples, both matrix and class sites. Uh, and we had basically mostly similar results, right? We had two components, um, one that was random at the higher temperature before the material was in place, and one at a low temperature that was aligned after the material was in place. And what we do when that happens is we can figure out even more precisely what was going on, what was the temperature. And so the way we do that was look, we look at our, our uh, vector component plot, our, our demagnetization plot, and we look at the two components. And the place where there's a, an obvious, hopefully obvious or sometimes not quite so obvious break between our components is basically what we interpret to be about our emplacement temperature. And so you can see, at least in the two on the right, the, the break between the two components is, is pretty clear. And, uh, and so that gives us a temperature on in this one on the upper right of 410 degrees and, uh, and the bottom right of 300 degrees. And so what we had across all of our sites was uh, in seven of the eight sites that we, we had, uh, we had temperatures uh, ranging from 250 degrees to over 500 degrees. And what that indicated to us was that these deposits, um, at least the deposits we sampled were mostly emplaced by a PDC and they weren't remobilized deposits from, from uh, an earlier eruption that, that was smaller. So what did we learn from this uh, about studying volcanoes with, with Peleomag? Uh, we learned that this, this deposit, these deposits um, were actually emplaced not from, from lahars, from reworked material, but from uh, PDC deposits that were emplaced at a uh, potentially a range of temperatures, but at least 250 degrees at a minimum. Um, 
And based on the deposit locations and distances and the thicknesses of the deposits where we found them, uh, this is more on the volcanological side, that, that it's probably in the range of some of the larger eruptions that, that have been identified at this volcano. And, and so it's important for the hazard because we're not saying that this is going to happen in every eruption, that every eruption is going to sort of send these, these devastating PDCs all the way to the coast. But it is among the worst case scenarios, and so it's something that's worth thinking about. And so in 2021, the civil defense of the region was, was making new hazard material to, to educate people who live there. And part of that was making a new map. And so what they did was they still have this high hazard area in the center because that's still the most likely area for PDCs. But now this is a map of, of just PDC hazard. And what they've done is they've said, okay, now, now there is some hazard that's worth considering um, much further away than we previously said. And so this is a useful um, application of, of the work we've done. Okay, so lava flows. We're going to change track and, and look at a different study that's looking at lava flows. Uh, and so, yeah, as a reminder, right, lava flows can be at temperatures up to around 1,000 degrees Celsius, so high heat. Again, they re redistribute heat internally through conduction and convection. And, uh, and then the important part for, for paleomagnetism for us is that they conduct heat into adjacent materials. So if they touch other stuff, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, they, they send the heat into the other material that they're touching, or even uh, if they're just near other materials, right, through radiative heat, they can also heat nearby materials. And so, uh, and to different extents, right? So we see in this little cartoon, schematic on the right, you see you have your lava flow on the surface and, and the heat is extending into the ground under it to, to different amounts. Um, and this is dependent on a variety of factors. So the lava and the substrate, so whatever is under the lava and, and depending on what type of lava we're talking about, they have different properties themselves that affect how they, they conduct and, and how the heat is transferred. Uh, and then also there's a number of lava flow characteristics that are really important. So how thick is the lava flow over the material that, that it's above? Uh, what's the flow rate? So how much lava is coming past? Uh, what's the temperature of the lava flow? And, uh, and how long is this lava flow active on top of the material it's over, right? So some of these things are, are intuitive. The longer the lava flow is hot above the, the material under it, the, the more the heat will, will be able to extend below. And so why does this matter? So it matters. The main the main reason that we're we're interested in this is that it's a hazard to buried infrastructure. So there are are some urban areas that that are at risk to to uh, lava flows. So there are um, urban areas like uh, like Goma near near Gongo or uh, or Auckland in New Zealand, which is basically built on an active volcanic field, where planning is being done in in the case of uh, potential lava flows in the city. And cities often have buried infrastructure, right? So there's water pipes, there's, there's uh, fiber lines, there's electrical lines, and they're buried. And if there's lava flowing over that stuff, we want to know what's a deep enough depth to bury this stuff that, that it's not going to be affected by the heat. Or, or what are our different lava scenarios, depending on how much lava do we have? What are the chances that it affects the, the stuff underneath it? So, so that's an important hazard consideration. Um, there's some other, other reasons as well that, that it's an important thing to study. Okay, so uh, just to show sort of the properties of, of, of how, how this reheating uh, affects the thermal remnant magnetization, which a lot of you will, will have already seen these diagrams a million times, but uh, basically uh, our, our sort of baseline scenario is that we have uh, our material, normal volcanic material that's at high temperature, uh, and we have our magnetic grains that are randomly aligned. We cool it down, uh, and we align all of our grains in the same direction, right? That's, that's standard. Uh, then some time passes, and we have a magnetic field that's, that's significantly different enough to tell the difference from our old magnetic field. And let's say we heat up that material. In this case, let's say we heat it up all the way, right? Um, we randomize our grains again because we're above the Curie temperature and we cool down again and we will take on the direction of the new field. So this is, this is pretty, 
basic value of magnetism. And let's say we, we do that partially. So if we heated our, our material back up only to uh, 300 degrees, and um, then we would, we would overprint the, the magnetic direction up to that temperature and, and keep our old direction above that temperature. Okay, so let's say we're looking at soils, or at least the way we've found it in soils, and 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 in this case we're assuming soils that are are probably volcanically derived, or soils that that have some magnetic material in them, right? Because in order to to study the paleomagnetism, we need that. Uh, but luckily, we were working in this study in New Zealand and Hawaii, which which have magnetically uh, soils with magnetic material in them because they're volcanically derived. So again, we have our magnetic field. Uh, this time we have a soil that is at ambient temperature, uh, and and what we found is that soils typically, uh, because they're just they're broken down material from 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 pre-existing material, they have a weak or or random direction, uh, so they are not showing strong alignment typically, even if they have magnetic material in them. But if we heat those soils up. Because they've contained magnetic material, now we still have our random alignment, but we're above Curie temperature. And now if we cool them down, they do take an alignment um, because of the magnetic material. And it may not be as strong as, as a basalt or, or an andesite or another volcanic rock, but it does exist and, and we can measure it. And, and so this is the property that we're going to use to, to look at how much heat spreads below lava flows. So the way we do that is basically we imagine our lava flow and it's flowing over some pre-existing substrate. And we imagine that once this lava flow is heated and cooled the material, um, it's affecting stuff more that's close to the lava flow, right? So it's, it's going to transfer the heat more into stuff that's close and less into stuff that's far away or, or next to it. And, um, and so you can see sort of just through how I've shown these arrows, we'd expect to see this realignment of the magnetic material. Uh, more when it's close under the lava flow and less when it's farther away from the lava flow. And so the, the obvious way to approach this is to sample sequentially uh, a profile uh, perpendicular to the lava flow. So, so if we're sampling below the lava flow, then we continue to sample down to a depth uh, below the lava flow. And we would expect to see different results in our different samples. So uh, what did we do? You can see from these pictures on the right that the material we sampled was quite different that was below the lava flows. And so we sampled uh, some uh, scoria berm that was a uh, human made scoria berm that was below one of the 2018 lava flows. Uh, we sampled some baked clay that was previously below lava flows in the Auckland volcanic field in New Zealand. And uh, as well in, in the Auckland volcanic field in New Zealand, some baked soils that are currently beneath a lava flow. And so the samples, as you can see from those pictures, were taken in different ways. So a core and then boxes or, or just boxes directly into the soil. Or in the case of our baked clays, they were cohesive enough to, to begin with that we were able to just drill them directly um, after, after taking them back as hand samples. And so, uh, so again, same as our previous study, we, we sort of consolidated these samples and cut them out of their boxes uh, so we could use thermal demagnetization. Uh, and what we got was uh, was these results. And so basically what we had in ours, um, once we reached the, the temperature at which they started to unblock, once we start to get our real results, was uh, a single component uh, of magnetization all the way up to the, uh, the origin. So basically a single, single heating all the way um, to the highest temperature we were able to heat. So we see that in our, our different samples. Um, and I'll get into the interpretation in a second. Uh, another note, these, this is an example from um, uh, alternating field demagnetization. And for, for both of the methods that I'm showing today, there's, there's stuff to be learned with, with alternating field demagnetization, but just not quite as much because the temperature is such an important thing about what we're, we're trying to understand. The, uh, the temperature steps that you get in a thermal demagnetization procedure, right, using heat to demagnetize our samples, does get us more data um, and important data that, that you just won't get with the sort of millitesla steps from, from alternating field demagnetization. And so if you need to use this, it, it works, but it's not quite as ideal, right? Um, so the interpretation is uh, 
that all of our samples in, in, in this study that we were able to get were, were heated until at least the maximum demagnetization temperature. And so in most of our samples, we were able to heat them to about 570 degrees until either they were mostly demagnetized or in some cases, because we had sort of consolidated these samples, they, they didn't all survive terribly well until, until we wanted them to. So, um, but the, the caveat here is that, that this temperature was reached to the maximum depth sample. Then in our study, uh, because of the way the sites were, we were only able to, to uh, sample to a maximum depth of 21 centimeters below the, the deepest uh, at the deepest site. And so what that means is that at, in, in our case, to at least 21 centimeters, uh, our, our samples were all heated to above Curie temperature by the lava flow. Uh, and so it, with this method, that means that sort of, if your samples are, I call it saturated, basically if they're heated to above Curie temperature, you can't get any kind of precise uh, heating temperatures. And what that means is that there's, there's improvements for this method that will get you more interesting results. And the obvious improvement is sample to a deeper depth. If you can't find a site where, where the accessible material beneath the flow is uh, ideally probably more than a meter or, or even more, of course, depending on, on properties of the flow. Um, and if you'd expect that the deeper you sample, um, the more you would expect to see uh, your, your component of, of stable direction wouldn't go all the way to the Curie temperature. You would have some random element above that where, uh, where the magnetic minerals have not been aligned by, by reheating. Uh, and the other way you can see that, which I didn't show, but, but you can see very easily if you sample that, uh, is a control sample, right? So you want to sample what's the, the soil typically like, so you can compare it to, uh, to your, your samples that you're measuring. And what the soil is typically like uh, is, is this random weak alignment. But maybe your underlying material could be another lava flow. And if that's the case, you would expect to see a strong direction. And it would be interesting to then compare and see if you have a strong stable direction uh, in the direction of the original lava flow that is then overprinted to some amount by, by the new lava flow. So in a sense, it's basically a version of the baked contact test where you're looking for the overprint of the pre-existing material. Um, and then of course, as we found, as our samples disintegrated a bit and were a bit hard to work with that it, uh, if you can find a site with, with samples with, with underlying material that, that makes for good samples, uh, it's going to mean that you're able to sort of demagnetize them more fully as much as you want to and, and ideally get the best results. So uh, just to, to summarize uh, from these two studies, uh, the, the relationship between paleomagnetism and temperature um, means that this works great in both directions. So we can use our volcanic rocks for all sorts of great paleomag studies about all sorts of things, but we can also turn it around and, and really, I think it's a valuable method for looking at volcanic processes um, and especially uh, even volcanic hazards because many volcanic hazards, uh, part of the reason they're hazardous is that they're, they're high temperature. That's how they cause their, their damage or their injury. Um, to a large extent, and so, so it's an important aspect that paleomag lets us study. Um, and paleomagnetism is, is a good proxy for temperature if we're using thermal demagnetization. Um, because it has these temperature steps, it, it can get us this resolution of, of temperature-based processes. Uh, and so, yeah, it can, it can provide us good information um, for better understanding hazard and, and impacts during past eruptions. And that's a really important thing in, in planning for future eruptions and mitigating future eruptions, where basically the more you know about these hazards and the more you know about the history of, of the relevant volcano, the, uh, the more, the better you can prepare, and the more you know what might happen in the future. So thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> Um, thank you. So if there is any question from the audience, please feel, feel free to raise your hand or write it in the chat. I can read it out for you. Uh, yes, Greg. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks very much for a really good talk. Um, 
I guess my, my question is not really a scientific one. Um, it's actually more of a policy one. I mean, how, I mean, I don't know if you've had any interactions with, with some of the local governments in these areas and, and the policy makers and, and, and the organizations responsible for uh, hazard mitigation, but I mean, how, how receptive are these sort of people and organizations to taking on board this kind of paleomagnetic data and actually incorporating it into uh, the hazard assessments that, 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 that you publish? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure it depends on where you are. Uh, but in New Zealand, I found it was, it's, they, they, there's a very good and close relationship in, in, in most of the places with the volcanoes between the, the local councils and the universities and the scientists. And so, yeah, this, this volcano Taranaki, where I was working, my, my supervisor had a, had a quite a long relationship with the civil defense and he would go periodically every year, I think, or more often to present relevant results to them. And, um, and so one year I like with this, this part that I presented here, I, I went to the council and I presented them my, my stuff and yeah, they seemed interested. And then, yeah, they are, they're always working with the universities. For example, when they, they did this, this project last year to sort of update all the hazard information, they basically did, they worked with all the, the uh, cartographers and, and the scientists at the universities in New Zealand that, that work on this volcano to try to update that. And they do that in Auckland as well with the volcanic field. The council really works with and funds a lot of, of relevant research. And so I think, yeah, the paleomagnetism, I think as long as you you put it in the context of, of the volcanology, because I think they're not necessarily at the council level familiar with, with paleomag, but if you put it in the context of, of how it's relevant to the volcano, I think they're very interested. Um, that helps because New Zealand is, is small and I think uh, it's easier to have this relationship. So I don't know if it's probably not quite so simple everywhere to get the ear of the, the local government or the national government, but um, maybe in some places it is. Thank you. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Greg, Greg too, Greg the second. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I mean, this is a topic that I'm obviously um, quite interested in. I've been, I was kind of wondering, right, when people are looking at at, at, at soils for um, you know paleoclimate proxies and all sorts, and, and they do you know measurements with magnetic susceptibilities, we heat the samples up, and and we tend to see this uh, magnetic enhancement. Um, yep. the sort of formation of new magnetic minerals when um, when we heat them up in the lab. I mean, do you do you see evidence of this um, um, in in some of your soil samples that you're looking at? And is there any you know is there any extra information to be gleaned about um, the kind of temperatures? You know, you can obviously see when things are happening above the Curie temperature, that, that's kind of then a, a, a bound, it's a limit. It doesn't actually tell you exactly what the temperature was, but you know, are there sort of other chemical reactions and things that you might be able to use to um, put other constraints on on temperatures? Probably. Um, so initially, basically, uh, the, the first bits of study that we did before we sort of figured out that you know came up with our way to remove the the samples from their little plastic boxes so we could actually heat them um, was basically just to look for for magnetic enhancement and, and or just the, the improvement of the, the strength of the signal sort of and and using alternating field. And so it already with that information, it was enough to to get a decent amount of information, maybe about the depth of the heating. Of course, you would then be missing sort of the precise temperature information. But um, but yeah, if you took that and you you uh, yeah, come if you if you have studies i mean i'm not i'm not super familiar with studies of sort of magnetic alteration and magnetic enhancement and and what happens at different temperatures but i would imagine with the information you could you could use that to look at if it's you expect to have a certain mineral formed or or change in the mineralogy uh with heating to a certain temperature i'm sure you could uh you could add that onto the paleomag to look when you get to higher temperatures where the paleomag isn't getting you uh, 
your information anymore. Thank you. It's always very a uh, multidisciplinary anyway as an approach. So um, we we collaborate with volcanologists, but also geochemistry and others, right? So I mean, usually a team yeah. effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I like to see these methods combined with with other methods. I mean, I think a lot of volcanologists overlook paleo mag because it's labor and you know it's it's the sampling and the the measurement is labor intensive and so but i feel like a lot of the time with volcanology studies it's really simple to say oh let's just you know we'll add the geochem to the paper because 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 we have it and it's useful for people to know i feel like that's something that sometimes could be could be done with paleo mag why not uh do enhance our study with with some one of these methods with some some type of paleo mag. I think that can be done a lot more than it is, maybe. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I don't know if there is other, uh, any other question from the audience. I guess I have one. Well, I have many. <laughs> sure. That's why we keep doing research on it, <laughs> because we still uh, have many questions. Exactly. But sure. My uh, my question was regarding the study of the anisotropic magnetic susceptibility. Yeah. Uh, when you apply it on lahars and when you apply it to PDCs that you suspect they were lahars, do you expect kind of a different outcome from these two cases? Uh, so, hmm. so I, I mean, I I mean in terms, can... oh, sorry, in terms of like how good your AMS data could be out of these two cases. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I guess the AMS. With the AMS, we're talking about a physical realignment, right? Rather than than the the alignment of the the remnants. And so, I did a little bit of I didn't I didn't sort of do enough of it to make a study out of it, but I was I did a little bit of AMS on on the PDCs uh, just to see, and and I got what you would basically expect, which is aligned with with the flow direction. So basically, you get uh, the, at the point at which I sampled them, they were flowing over an extremely low angle, like two, three degree slope, and and then so basically you get uh, an almost flat, you know, an almost horizontal uh, direction of, of flow. So it makes sense at least. Um, if you used it on Mahars, I haven't tried that. Uh, what the deposits that I knew for sure were cold, and I would guess you'd probably, since it's a physical realignment, I would guess you'd probably get the same kind of result i think you would it would physically align in the in the flow direction whatever that direction is um i think with that it's interesting we were trying i was trying to use it at some point and again i didn't i didn't have really good ams equipment so i i wasn't uh for measuring so i wasn't wasn't doing it super formally but we were looking at hydrothermal deposits and the problem with them also is they're not necessarily hot enough to well, but it's a physical realignment again we were trying to figure out where were unknown uh eruptive craters and so that i think would be interesting more uh because if you could collect the flow directions from a whole bunch of deposits uh and they all seem to be coming from from some unknown place it would be quite interesting thank you thank you very much okay. um if there are no other questions, maybe we can just give Jeff another big round of applause. Uh, thanks, thanks again for your talk. And uh, I'm gonna be sharing a few slides left. Mm -hmm. So upcoming uh, seminars, we have 2nd of November, Joe and Matt from Florida. 16 of November, Despina Kondopolo from uh, Thessaloniki in Greece. And we are soliciting sp uh, speakers for next year. So if you are interested to, to give a seminar, uh, please contact uh, myself or any other member of the team. And uh, please uh, know that this uh, seminar together with the previous one can be found on our YouTube channel that you're welcome to like, join, watch, or watch anytime you want. 
And uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining.